Hey everyone, welcome back to the She Found Motherhood podcast. Today, I'm chatting with Dr. Elise Graham. She's a physician and board certified pediatric otolaryngologist. She's also a mom of two young kids and had her own challenging breastfeeding journey. Elise and I are diving into the controversial topic of tongue ties. Now, I just ask that you remember that we're both physicians and we come at this from an evidence based perspective. Our goal in this podcast is to share what evidence there is out there, what benefits there is to treating tongue ties, and what alternative options might be. Hopefully you find this a helpful and educational conversation. We'll get into the podcast right after this quick message. Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. We are doctors Sarah and Alicia, maternity physicians and moms who have been through it all. We want to empower you with knowledge so you can have the best pregnancy, birth, and postpartum experience you can. She Found Health and She Found Motherhood is meant for general medical information only. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This information does not apply to every situation. If you have questions or if you've received different advice, please contact your healthcare provider. Always seek the advice of your physician or another qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. The views expressed by She Found Found Health and She Found Motherhood and our guests are not representative of any of the institutions with which we are affiliated. Some of our podcast episodes are sponsored so that we can keep getting great info out there to you, our listeners. We only partner with companies that we truly believe in. Some of our links and suggestions may be affiliates, and we would appreciate you using them to help fund this important work. Now let's get to it. Welcome, Elise, to the She Found Motherhood podcast. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. I'm so excited. I feel like our conversation has been a long time coming. Wow. It took me a little while to get myself feeling like really up to date on my research. Oh, yeah. Especially a topic like this, like we talked about before we started recording, which is very controversial. Yes. Um, yeah. And people have really strong opinions on. I think it's really important to come with as much of an evidence-based background as we can. And I've done a lot of research recently into the, the most recent papers and publications and systematic reviews. And if there is an article, I have probably read it. Awesome. Okay. So I thought today we would just get started and you can share a little bit about yourself, your background, your training and why you are interested in this topic. I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist, head neck surgeon, so and a pediatric ENT surgeon for short. I did my medical school and residency training at Dahaz University in Halifax and then went to uh, Salt Lake City, Utah for a pediatric ENT fellowship. And my interest in breastfeeding medicine and in tongue ties in general came a bit later, actually. I am a mom of two little boys and with the first one, breastfeeding didn't come easy. And, you know, tongue tie wasn't an issue for us, but uh, there was a lot of help that I needed. And I became interested in supporting my patients breastfeeding. So complex patients and parents still want to breastfeed if there's or may want to breastfeed if there's airway anomalies or other com complex uh, situations with their baby. And I don't always feel like my service does a great job of my specialty in general does a great job of supporting patients. I was getting a lot of discussion about tongue ties as well. And I think, again, my specialty is the oral anatomy expert, but I think some of us um, get into this trap where we say one metric is fine in the tongue. So everything is fine. And I wanted to provide a better service than that. I'm doing some training in breastfeeding medicine, working towards getting my IBCLC lactation consultant de designation and working towards a fellowship through the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. Oh, that's amazing. Ah, so I'm, I'm excited. I should write my IBCLC soon. And then it takes five years for the ABM fellowship. So I'm awesome. in practice. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. I want to ask you more about the ABM fellowship after, but I thought maybe you could start by just explaining to our listeners a little bit about basic oral anatomy and the function of the tongue and the frenulum, just so we understand the, the basic where we're going from when we're talking about tongue ties and abnormalities. So infant airways are actually designed differently than adult airways. There's a lot of differences. And the way that they are is optimized for breastfeeding through evolution, obviously, because that's how we fed babies throughout time. So the um, voice box is higher in the neck, and that allows the palate, the soft palate and the epiglottis, which is the flap that covers the breathing tube when you swallow. That allows them to touch so babies can breathe through their nose at the same time as they nurse. And actually, an interesting thing about that is that uh, if a baby is born with complete nasal obstruction, that means it's a surgical emergency. That's something that we have to address immediately. So it's an interesting anatomy fact. The tongue needs to move in order to 
it cups the nipple at the soft and hard palate junction. So it needs to have some movement from down to up to hold the nipple in place there. And it also needs to be able to cup on the sides to hold the nipple in place. And throughout the breastfeeding sac, there's no air anywhere in the oral cavity at all. And the tongue is responsible for doing that. So it's about the basics of the anatomy. The oral frenulum, the lingual frenulum, is a structure below the tongue. It's actually not a discrete structure itself. It's a fold of tissue that is formed because the tongue elevates. So when the tongue lifts up, there's a fold of the tissues underneath. And how thick that tissue is depends on what's pulled into it. So it could just be the tissue on the floor of the mouth called the floor of mouth mucosa, or it could be a little bit of the fascia, which is thicker t- tissue below it, or even a tiny bit of the muscle that's right below it called the genioglossus muscle. It's one of the tongue muscles. And there's a really beautiful anatomic study that a New Zealand pediatric otolaryngologist uh, did, Nikki Mills, Dr. Nikki Mills, that kind of explains that anatomy really nicely. I think a lot of people think of the lingual frenulum as being uh, discrete, like a noodle or something a band under the tongue, and it's really just a fold. There's some other frenula that are described in the mouth. One is the upper lip or maxillofacial frenulum is a fold or tether between the upper um, incisors and the lip. And that frenulum has a lot more debate in terms of its role in anything. And most recent data suggests that it is a normal structure and there's almost no reason that needs to be divided. As long as the upper lip can be pulled out in order to allow brushing the upper teeth, honestly, then it's fine to leave that alone. Again, there's a you know a study that was done looking at the position of the upper lip of babies, because I think that the reason this became popular to think about lip ties is there's this idea that the upper lip has to be totally flipped yep. out a fish mouth. But this study, although it's small, it was 11 kids, and they looked on MRI of the position of the lip. And eight out of 11 kids had their lip in a neutral position. Two of them had them outwardly flange like that. And these are normal breastfeeding infants. And then one, they couldn't tell. So the recent, more recent data suggests the upper lip frenulum shouldn't be called a lip tie. It's just a lip frenulum. And there's not really any reason to divide it. Yeah, it's it's interesting to hear that because there's a lot of information out there. But what I would tell my best breastfeeding parents is I don't care how the lips look. It's how the latch feels. Mm-hmm. Well, for sure. Yeah. Some people, other things that people say about the lip ties are like, if you have a lip tie, you'll have a tongue tie too, or vice versa. Other studies show that they don't, like more recent studies show they don't cluster together at all. So I would try and take the lip tie out of the equation. It's not something that I think we have evidence at the present time influences breastfeeding or anything else. Yeah. Even dividing it doesn't prevent an upper teeth gap necessarily. Oh, I've uh, seen that out there. Yeah. There's not evidence to suggest that. And again, if the If it seems like it's going to interfere with orthodontics in the future, then, you know, a kid is older and you can divide it with them awake and consenting to the procedure with some freezing rather than a painful procedure when they're a baby or something requiring general anesthetic. Mm -hmm. Which is a big deal for kids. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So when we're talking about the frenulum impacting breastfeeding and so tongue tie, let's talk about how this is diagnosed and the lack of consensus around diagnosis. So that's another really interesting point. <laughs> yeah. everything, everything to do with the tongue tie. There are tons and tons of papers. If you look on PubMed, which is the usual source we use for finding medical literature, the number of publications has just exploded over the last few years. But the quality of publications, and this is one of the problems, it, it really varies. Yeah. Um, the, from a uh, breastfeeding perspective, that's the best evidence for tongue ties having a role. But in terms of how to even diagnose a tongue tie, which is your question, there are multiple tools and there are also classification schemes that are used. The classification schemes I find to be less helpful because it's just a description of how it looks. And that doesn't tell you very much about the function. So examples of this are like Cotlow and Coriolis kind of thing. I may have heard of those classifications. My favorite tool is called the Tabby tool or the BTAT, Bristol Tongue Tie Assessment Tool. And these are validated tools that look at the way the tongue moves. So it's not just where it inserts. So it looks at how the tongue tip looks when the tongue elevates, where the uh, frenulum is attached on the lower gum line, um, and how it elevates on the side. So I think I find that to be a useful tool. It gives you a score. It's one score a score that's lower suggests that there's more likely to be dysfunction, but using that tool doesn't say this must be divided. It just gives you some information to communicate with other specialists and document, which I find helpful. 
Yeah. And I think one thing I found with going through the literature is that there's actually really not a lot of good consensus around what tools or how to diagnose it. No, that's definitely true. The Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine put out a frenulum or, you know, ankyloglossia position statement, and they mentioned that there are four tools that they that they like, but that's not exhaustive. And those are two of them. But uh, you're right. Every paper you read has different tools used. And the interrater reliability, you know, how you might rate them versus someone else who rated them later is very different for these different tools. So it, it's challenging. Yeah, it's really challenging. Yeah. And, and what's interesting, and maybe we can speak to this now, you said before we started recording, is the, the number of diagnoses has increased dramatically in the last few years, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the best data is from the U.S. And uh, there was a group that published their discharge hospital data. So these are people leaving the hospital after birth. And they found between the years of 97 and 2012, the diagnosis had gone up over 800% for tongue ties. And then they did a follow-up study four years later, 2012 to 2016, and found another 100%. So even steeper slope in diagnosis. And this is just on discharge. So people who have had the diagnosis or the treatment had a clip when they're discharged from hospital, which is not all patients. So I think it's vastly underestimating the the rate of diagnosis. And Canada too, uh, the increase has been over 200% over a 10-year period in the study. It's I, some would argue, and I think it's true that there is more awareness mm -hmm. uh, to tongue tie as an entity and an issue. But I also think if we look at this with a critical eye, there it it does not seem possible that there are eight hundred percent more tongue ties than there were before. Yeah, uh, they you know it, the popularity of tongue ties as an entity popularity in air quotation marks the awareness. Yeah, does wax and wane with the popularity or knowledge around breastfeeding. So in the, the 50s, when formula became really popular and was a bit of a status symbol as well, instead of breast milk, people didn't really talk about tongue ties anymore in the literature or in popular media. But then in the 90s, when it became more known that breastfeeding was so beneficial, that's when the discussion increased a lot. It's interesting, hey? Yeah, it's interesting how much I think popular media and social media these days has really impacts diagnosis and trends, right? You just look at how much information there is out there around tongue ties. And I really struggle because as a physician, we want to practice evidence-based care and we also want to at first do no harm. And maybe you can talk about that next. I don't think that performing phrenectomy, is that how we say it? Clipping a tongue tie is a, is a minor procedure. So it, it can be, but it also can be a devastating procedure. And first of all, the ter terminology, there's phrenotomy, uh, phrenectomy, and no. phrenulasty. These are all the same <laughs> thing. Can yeah. Phrenotomy just means cutting. Phrenectomy implies removing. So sometimes people will use that term. I think there's a, maybe, there may be a billing difference, actually, if you, write, if you say it's a removal versus a clip. Yeah. Um, but usually those are interchangeable. And then frenuloplasty describes some, there should be some rearrangement of tissue. So like some suturing or something like that. So yeah. those are all different terms that kind of achieve the same goal. It's the most common complications are a little bit of bleeding, which is minimal and some pain. But there are case reports, including one we published here, of people, of babies having bleeding that's bad enough that it leads them to be in shock and you need IV fluids, kind of resuscitation to make them better. There are other complications like nerve injury that's really hard to, quant you know, it's, it's hard to diagnose in a baby. There's little teeny tiny nerves that control the sensation of the tongue tip. They're very close and a baby can't tell you if their sensation wow. of their tongue is different. Laser is very popular, but has a risk of thermal injury. The people who like laser say that it's less likely to bleed, but actually our case was a delayed bleed after a laser. It still occurs. The other thing that's not discussed very much is oral aversion. So initially when you cut a tongue tie, what I do, I use, if I do a tongue tie release, I use sharp scissors and then I put baby directly to breast, which is the best pain control. I'll often give a little sugar water first too, but sometimes they'll, babies will do okay at first. Even they may have some numbness from a laser, for example, immediately, but then develop significant pain after the fact. And then you can have breast refusal, oral aversion, dehydration, that kind of thing. And again, it's hard to know, you know, if that's going to happen and it's pretty tough to manage as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think the only ones I've ever done, clearly, because I am a family physician, not an ENT, are the, just the super obvious, like, thin, but significant, just that clear avascular that we just clip it and put baby on the breast. But 
Yeah, the more invasive the laser procedures, I just worry about those because the research I've done has shown that I don't know if there's actually truly a really significant benefit when it comes to breastfeeding and potential long-term outcomes. So the best evidence there is for tongue-tie release is for breastfeeding. And it's actually, there was a systematic review, I think it was in 2015. That So that's a collection of data from a bunch of different papers that they look at the quality of the paper and they use that when they're deciding on reporting their results and look at a larger number, pooling together all the different patients. And that found that there was, they could show uh, a significant improvement in maternal pain that was short-term. That was the only thing they could definitively say a tongue-tie release provided in terms of benefit. I think the literature is still lacking and we have work to do, but I think in a significant tongue-tie, there is an improvement in latch and transfer in, yeah. in babies, though the it doesn't really come out in the systematic reviews. In terms of you know technique, laser versus scissor, all we can say about that based on the current literature is that there's not a benefit to laser. So it's the... The literature does not suggest there's a benefit. And my personal feeling and perhaps bias is that I feel that scissor is superior because I can control much more and there's no surrounding injury related to the heat. But again, I think that there's a lot of debate about that, especially from people who use uh, laser. They feel that it's superior and that's the reason they use it. Yeah. Hey, Sarah. Yes, Alicia. Did you have any problems with newborn sleep? Oh my gosh, I sure did, especially with my first. Me too. I wish I'd known more about what to expect going into it. I know, and I wish that I had known to create a sleep plan with my partner. I know, how can you support each other to get the sleep that you need while supporting your little baby? Totally. So guess what, guys? That's why we created the Newborn Sleep 101 course. In this course, we discuss what does newborn sleep look like? And how can we help support that sweet little baby to become the best sleeper they can? While also supporting you and your partner as you navigate this complex, sleep-deprived time. We talk about how to set up your nursery or your bedroom to optimize both your sleep and your newborn sleep. And we also start talking about how you can start implementing routines and schedules into your day and your newborn so that by the time they're three or four months, it's well-established. Because guess what? That's when they start to really need it. If you're interested in learning more, head to our website, www.shefoundhealth.com courses. We hope that you get better sleep than we did. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize what you said to make sure I understand and people understand is that in terms of so in terms of diagnosis, there's not any really clear consensus. There's a few tools that we can use, but there's problems with inter-rater reliability, meaning that I might diagnose one grade, you might diagnose a different grade based on our assessment of the same baby. Is that correct? It is. I think that's more true of the um, classification schemes than the tools. I find the place more useful um, because... They have very, they have nice pictures. The yeah. tabby, I think, is lovely. But yes, that is a, that's a concern for sure. And then when it comes to evidence around doing a release, the best evidence that we have is for maternal pain, improvement in pain of the breastfeeding or chest feeding individual, and potentially improvement in latch and mouth transfer, but that's just not yet represented in the literature. Is that right? I think that's pretty accurate. And I think most people who provide the procedure feel that there is a benefit, but we have yeah. to yeah, show it really well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And can you differentiate by what people mean when we mean anterior versus posterior tongue tie? So that's another huge right? Uh, yeah. And I don't know what a posterior tongue tie is. And I am a pediatric. Feel better. <laughs> I'm a pediatric mouth. Like I am a mouth expert. And if you look at the papers by professional bodies, that's the same for them. So the Academy, again, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine put out a um, consensus or a position statement, and they did not mention the word posterior tongue tie once in it. And that's on, I went to the presentation on that uh, at the conference, and that was intentional because there's so much debate about what a posterior tongue tie is. Same with the American Academy of Otolaryngology. There's a recent position statement or consensus statement. And in that, they could not come to any agreement on what a posterior tongue tie represented. Even when they said something as, sim- as simple as some people feel that a posterior tongue tie is a tongue tie that is not at the tip and restricts movement. That's they we couldn't even get to agreement yeah. on that. So I think that that's a term that I don't use either. I feel that I'm just not sure that there's a consistent definition of it. And for me, what's important is, is there a structure that is restricting or is there is there tissue that is restricting tongue mobility? And that's what's important. And that's what I'm going to deal with, not anterior versus posterior. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I think a, t- a tongue tie is a tongue tie. Yes. And it has, it has to do with function and it doesn't have to. Yes. I, I think it's a relevant kind of the position. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I think we talked about this, but I want to come back to it and talking about the potential um, consequences are, or, you know, adverse outcomes associated with, we talked about the risk of bleeding, infection, nerve injury. And in the short term, you, that could lead to, well, bleeding obviously could lead to like need for hospitalization, resuscitation, blood transfusion, even more worrisome outcomes we don't need to talk about. And oral aversion, is there any potential for more delayed like food aversions or impact in speech? And we'll talk about the benefits or not of speech later, but just in terms of the adverse outcomes related to a phrenotomy or phrenectomy? I don't think that there's evidence that there would be a delayed onset of those things, though there we did see in our, our case that we published, a patient came in seven days following their tongue tie release and had bleeding then. So that was a surprise. That's actually how we, when tonsils bleed after tonsil surgery, it's usually a week after. So we suppose maybe it's a similar mechanism, but typically it's a, an immediate thing that we see. And we don't, I'm not aware of evidence that suggests that you have a delayed onset of complications in speech or swallowing related to tongue tie release, not in the literature that I've seen. I will say that the vast majority of tongue tie releases are uncomplicated. So I don't want people terrified, but I just think sometimes it, it's presented as, well, let's just do this. It's, it's risk-free. And if it works great, if it doesn't, whatever. But I think that we should think about the procedures we're doing and make sure that they're indicated, even if they're in quotes minor, because it can have complications. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the other indications we briefly touched on was an, an argument for uh, releasing a tongue tie for speech. And can you speak to the evidence around that a little bit? Sure. The current consensus is that this that tongue tie should not be divided prophylactically for speech. So just in case, the data surrounding speech outcomes and tongue ties is also poor. So again, I use systematic reviews because they're a pooling of multiple studies. And you can get a study that is poor quality published. So just because something is in the literature doesn't mean that it's good evidence. And that's something that I think it's really important to think about. So the systematic reviews, there are four related to speech, and all of them show that there's insufficient evidence to perform phrenotomy for speech indications. That said, there are selected patients, like some people have gone through speech therapy, and I think that's the first step always, lots of speech therapy. They have a significant tongue tie, and they have a speech issue related to that particular, certain sounds like s, s, the TH sound and so on, do require a little bit more tongue mobility. In those cases, I would have a discussion with families about division with a strong caveat that I may make no difference. So it has to be a, an informed discussion. And the speech language pathologists I work with agree, typically things can be worked past. It's not necessary to divide for that reason. Very rarely, I will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. There's, I feel like a topic like this is we're never going to get clear consensus and it's always an, an informed consent discussion. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so in general, okay, I'm going to summarize our conversation. Let's see if this works. So in general, it is, it's not a, a small procedure. It does have potential adverse risks, which depending on like the level of the, the level. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to explain when you can see just that little thin band so if it's of the tie does make a difference. And I think if someone's dividing, they should have the ability to manage the complication. So if someone's, if someone is cutting it, they should be able to manage it if it bleeds. That's another yes. thing to think about um, when you're yes. doing it. Yeah. So it is, it can be a minor procedure, but we shouldn't assume that it will be. We need to do it because it's necessary, not because we may as well. Yes, yes. And it can help latch, but probably mm -hmm. maternal pain, definitely, probably milk transfer. And then in, in, I would argue in breastfeeding, the same as in speech pathology, you might want to try some other techniques before you yeah. do an invasive procedure, working on latch, reestablishing, trying some other tools and techniques yeah. before you jump to clipping a tongue tie. A hundred percent. You should always be assessed by a, an experienced professional who has expertise in lactation. Things like correcting the latch, all, all those things are really important. And that's the way that we do all surgery. We don't jump to surgery for, for anything unless we make sure that medicine doesn't work or like medical therapy doesn't work and should be the same. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. We approach it so differently, but you're right. And I think it's funny because I've done like family medicine, obstetrics, breastfeeding stuff for a number of years now, but not until I did my extra training. So I was like, oh my gosh. Like small position changes for both mom and baby can make such a huge impact for latch. Mm -hmm. But I think it's absolutely right. If someone says you have a tongue tie, I would say, okay, go to see a provider, get some support with maternal and infant positioning, see if you can improve the latch and improve the milk transfer. And if you can't, then you could consider further intervention. But exactly, if you have osteoarthritis, mild osteoarthritis of your knee, 
you're not going to jump to a knee replacement. You're going to say, okay. Yeah, okay, let's do some physio. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And, this, and I think, again, it's probably, there's probably a, a few different reasons that we seem to jump to a surgical procedure for this. You know, one is it's felt to be so minor that I think people yeah. view it like, oh, let's just get this off the table when it just may not be necessary. And we may put kids at risk for oral aversion, bleeding, et cetera. The other thing is I'll name the elephant in the room. There is some financial yeah. incentive to divide tongue ties. So that's something to consider just when you look around. There are some places that have made a business out of tongue tie release. And you just have to be aware of that. So if it seems like everybody who goes through the door gets a tongue tie release, then maybe that's not where you want to go. You want to be sure that you're getting appropriate support before you go down that road. And certainly not every place is like that. I think most people have patients' best interests in mind, but it is, it can be pretty financially lucrative. Yeah. Which is crazy because it's not lucrative for you. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it is a procedure that is covered by OHIP. So if it's done by a physician, if your family doctor does it, when you leave the hospital or whatever, it would be covered. But if it, you can find it private pay and it's very expensive yeah, to patients. It's same here in BC. Like we can do it and bill for it but to go to a private clinic it's like five six seven eight hundred dollars that's, that's the same here yeah and again i don't think everybody's out for the wrong really? reason but yeah. i just you just have to do your they always say do your research and i that's the same for your your provider you want to be sure that you're getting the support you need and not a procedure just for the procedure's sake kind yeah. of thing yeah so do you have any favorite resources that we might recommend to people who are like oh my gosh I had no idea there was such controversy and that the evidence isn't there where might you direct people for like easily easy digestible information that's that is a great question i think it is challenging to find yeah. good information if yeah. you look at tongue tie on social media you get greater just the word hashtag tongue tie no uh, modification to it you get over 100,000 posts i think it is very challenging to find evidence-based information. Most of the best evidence-based things are at physician level, I would say. So the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine has free protocols that you can look on. It's bfmed.org slash protocols. And they have a phrenotomy protocol. So that describes all the evidence around phrenotomies. And I'm a part of the team that's rewriting, reviving oh, it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, JAMA also puts out patient pages, and I ha I think there will be one about phrenotomy soon. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, so that's one thing to look for. JAMA is a great resource for evidence-based information. It's challenging to find at a parent level. I try to do a little bit on my own social media, but again, it's such a charged topic that one has to be careful how one approaches it. And some other things that I think are important to know about tongue ties, there are many other things that are that they're reported to be associated with, which for which the evidence is really poor. So an example is sleep apnea people say that oh, yeah. sleep apnea yeah. so our consensus statement the ENT consensus statement says that all it says about that is tongue ties do not cause sleep apnea full agreement kind of thing so it's just not it's not a thing yeah um, and they if anything there are certain patients that I take care of who have really small chins it's called yeah. pierre yeah. sequence so they get um airway obstruction because the tongue falls back yeah. and actually having a tongue tie is protective in those yeah. sort of situation having your tongue held forward so it just doesn't make physiologic sense that there would be improvement in sleep if your tongue was less tethered forward. The second argument. Yeah, about, it's like yeah. the opposite. Exactly. Yeah. The second argument that people make about it is they say it's long term. So when the tongue is tethered, it can't sit properly in the palate. So the palate becomes more high arch. So you develop a breathing posture. And again, the evidence for that, there are papers about it, but the evidence is so poor that we just can't make that conclusion at the present time. Maybe if we find there's a really great paper that suggests that's true, I'll change my tune. But at the present time, there's no evidence that's the case. But other things are reflux. People say tongue ties cause reflux uh, because you get swallowing of air, aerophagia. Oh, okay. That's what the discussion is. I've asked my GI colleagues and they thought I was crazy. This is not something that causes reflux in, yeah. the, in the GI. That's not something they look for as a cause. There's no evidence. The paper that describes this that's quoted on social media is, I think it's from 2014. It is a single individual's tongue tie practice looking if they're continuing to use reflux medications. So it's not a causative thing. And then they decide at the end that it's called reflux aerophagia. Like that they, many people stopped using their reflux meds after their tongue tie release. Therefore, it is reflux aerophagia that caused their reflux. Oh, that's no, that's, 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 it's not a good quality study at all. And it's very widely quoted all over social media. Ah, that's another thing. Um, I'm trying to think of what, I mean, they cause everything according to okay. tension. Again, oh yes, yeah, that's a huge uh, one, tension. There's not evidence for that. What people will say is 
the I've seen posts that are like the tongue is it the fascia of the tongue is attached to the fascia of the spine and therefore tension here leads to downstream muscle tightness. There's just no there's just no evidence that's the case. I don't know what the relevance of tension is exactly like torticollis. This none of this is related to tongue tie. The fascia in your body is all interconnected and it all ultimately is likely connected yeah. to your spine yeah. in some way. So again, it sounds good, but it it doesn't make sense. It's just tongue ties cause everything uh yeah. according to popular media and the evidence does not doesn't fit with that maybe there'll be more evidence maybe people will do more studies and do a better job of proving this but i have to go with what we have now and it just there's no evidence yeah okay that's really helpful and i think people you know who are listening it's important to understand that like we are coming from a medical evidence-based lens and this is breastfeeding and tongue ties people are so passionate about it and I always say evidence and statistics are great for population, but when it comes to you and your individual experience, like we're not discounting your experience. No, absolutely not. We're just showing, t saying what the evidence shows so that we can properly counsel our patients. And I think ultimately, like you said, it comes down to the risks and the benefits of any intervention and any procedure are never zero, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think another problem with my specialty, and I could say this because it's my specialty, is sometimes we are a bit dismissive of people's yeah. concerns about it. Yeah. Maybe we don't have the time, or not all of us have the time or the training. So if you come in and you're really, or if, if a parent comes in, I'm a parent too, if you come in and you're really worried about something and someone says, no, that's not it. Look, he can stick out his tongue over his gum. He's got no problems, but you're having terrible pain and you're not being supported. Obviously you're going to find someone else to help you. And I feel if I've got the time, I've got the time or I make the time for this and we talk through the evidence and lip ties, I get a lot of referrals for lip ties, for example. I think some people say, no, this is not a thing. And then that, but if you go to someone else who's got the time to talk to you, maybe their interpretation of the literature is different and you end up with a lip tie release, you know I mean? yeah. which doesn't have much evidence. I should, speaking of things with no evidence, have you heard of cheek ties? Is this something that's come up in your oh, life? Oh, not yet. Not yet, maybe, but I probably have chosen to ignore it. But yeah, that's smart. And buckle ties are the latest trend. There's a band of tissue. Yeah, that if you lift up your cheek, you will see a band of tissue that goes oh, yeah. from your gum to your cheek. There is no evidence that this should be divided. Uh, this is the latest thing that's getting divided right now in an outpatient setting. It's... If anything, again, it's counterintuitive. Stabilizing the buccal fat pads, the cheek fat. Yes. Back. So if you right. describe this, it would decrease. But it yeah. yeah. And so it's it, it's very common to have these divided, but the the evidence is not there. So again, consensus statement from us is buccal ties do not exist. Yeah, so it's just not a thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Wow. What a what an insightful podcast. Thank you so much, Elise, for taking the time. Well, I'm really happy to be here. And this is a topic that I'm really passionate about. And I feel, yeah. you know, I think a lot of the problem is a lack of support. I, mean, I, I agree. Think, yeah. People are, breastfeeding is not easy. It is a struggle. There are, so for some people, it's beautiful and natural and so on. But that's, I feel like that's less of a common experience than having some issues. And I think in some cases, the, the tongue tie is such a low hanging fruit that it is the first thing if there's any problem. And it's not always it's not always the problem. I think we just need to keep an open mind and look for other problems. There can be serious medical issues. There are misdiagnosis tongue tie. I've heard of kids getting a tongue tie release for noisy breathing, which was laryngoblation, which is a floppy airway problem and is very different. It's just when not everything is a nail I and mean, we just need to look at the whole child and the whole dyad, the mother and the baby together and their fit and find out what the real problem is and then address it. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And it's so funny because I think like the, you said lack of support. And in Victoria, which I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of people live here, but I, we have one breastfeeding medicine physician and I'm slowly making my way there full time. There's another one that's doing it part time. And when I told my husband, who's also a family physician, but I know he doesn't listen to this podcast, so he won't be offended that I was getting into breastfeeding medicine. He's like, and then I said, maybe I'll just do that like exclusively. And he's like, just breastfeeding. And I was like, just breastfeeding? Like, you remember how hard it was for me with my first? It is so hard. And so yeah, hard. Was, yeah, I was very lucky that I had a physician who was really literate and helped me, but it, it can go, it can go the opposite way. And I think that we shouldn't minimize, you know, I want to say the evidence is just for maternal pain. That is so important. We need to yeah. make it comfortable so that people can keep breastfeeding because breastfeeding is, though it's not for everyone, it is the optimal nutrition source for babies. It's designed for babies. 
I don't know. It's, I agree. I'm really passionate about breastfeeding medicine. The way that I'm going to use it in my practice is not lactation consultation, but to support complex babies who come see me and their parents want to continue breastfeeding or chest feeding or, you know, patients that have questions about things like oral ties and so on. I can support them. It's a really important field and there's, there's a lot to do and a whole lot of research that still needs to be done to. I agree. And I think so many, like, how great would it be for us to have an ENT like you here? Because people always ask me, well, who else can I go to? And I'm like, I don't know. Most of our PTNTs don't have an interest in this and don't know the literature and haven't done the training. And would they would patients would probably feel dismissed because, as you said, the evidence is very minimal. And so they just say, oh, no, it's not a thing. But that doesn't help when you're desperate for solutions to improve your breastfeeding experience. And I don't, I actually don't know the people in BC very well. So it may be that there's someone that is developing interest. I'm, I've been trying to do, take opportunities to do talks for my colleagues and for otolaryngologists elsewhere as well, just to talk about this topic. I think it comes up in community ENT a lot more than people expect that it will from their training. People, yeah. Is, should I divide it? What about sleep apnea? What about speech, et cetera? And we only know what we are taught to, to some degree. We have to do some reading, but yeah, it's, uh, it comes up a lot. And I think people are getting more interest. Yeah, perhaps they'll look me up. I'll happily do a talk out there. Yeah. Oh, that would be great. I will keep that in mind. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So I actually, even though we, we went to medical school together. So Elise and I were two years apart at Dow. So you were in first year and I was in third year. Yeah. So when you're in clerkship, you're barely around the campus. Yeah, that's right. You know the names of the the. Yeah. Most- well, but yeah. I, don't, yeah, I don't really know them very well. So, and then we reconnected on social media. So where can our listeners find you on social media to learn a bit more about what you share? And I love that you also share about your life and being a mother in medicine because it's freaking hard. I try my best to be pretty real about it. I'm at Elise GMD, E-L-I-S-E. GMD. And sometimes I'm better than others. We have a lot of seasons in our lives and sometimes it's too busy in my regular life to post, but uh, I do posting facts and quizzes and evidence-based things in addition to stuff about my own family and life and research. Some of it is about breastfeeding medicine. Some of it is about ENT topics in general. And I like interacting with people and hearing about their experiences. I can never give personalized medical advice and I never would, but uh, it's nice to hear what people are experiencing in their lives. Yeah. Awesome. We'll put that and we'll put your tag in the show notes below and I'll share some of those resources for people. Great. Thanks. It's been my pleasure to chat with you about this. There's just so much more to know. Uh, oh, I, know. I know. I feel like we could, there's many other topics we could cover. Thanks yeah. so much for taking time from your busy schedule. No problem. Again, it's my pleasure. Thanks awesome. for having me. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca and to sign up for our community for weekly bump blasts. Make sure to check us out on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood and head on over to your favorite podcast app and leave a review and a five-star rating. If you enjoyed this podcast, take a pic of yourself listening to it and share it on social. Make sure to tag us on it so we know to keep making them.